So anybody got a question this morning they wanted to work on? Yeah, Mr. Luke Wilson. I have a weird, obscure type of, um, when I think about lions that show up in the Old Testament, like David killing the lion with his hands or Samson, I've always pictured what I think of as African lion or, you know, maybe Asian, anyways. But I was, the climate would make me think more it would be mountain lions. But then I see pictures in Jewish history of what I think of the, the main African lion. So I don't know if, if you have any take on that. What, it was just a weird thought going through my mind. What kind of lions are these that these guys are killing? I don't know if you have any. Yeah, they're the same as the African lions. They seem to be, you know, part of Africa and that part of Asia. Yeah. They were there. Yeah. And you think of tigers, you usually think of tigers in Africa. But I, I saw, a, Mr. Matt might remember, we saw a, a Siberian tiger in, um, you know, kind of a special cat zoo in near Rosamond, California. That Siberian tiger was uh, four and a half feet tall at the shoulder, 12 feet long. And, and that's a Siberian, that's a tiger in Siberia. You know, 750 pound putty tat <laughs> tracking you down. <laughs> Probably. See, so a lot of those animals did, you know, were, were spread. Like I say, we think of tigers, but, you know, you can see that they're, they're, they actually spread those cats. You know, of course, they hunt them down. I mean, you, you know, you really don't want lions running loose in your neighborhood all the time, just any, any more than you want grizzly bears. Which is, you know, one of the reasons that the, you know, the Marxists that are intended to overthrow the existing social system, trying to unleash buffalo, trying to unleash grizzly bear, trying to unleash uh, wolves, and that sort of thing, because, you know, man can't live freely with those type. You know, the grizzly bears, the mountain men, you know, feared the grizzly bears, and, uh, you know, I'm I read, you know, a series of books on the frontier people. The last one was along the on the mountain men who really uh, what developed the, the pathways to the west and you know so you're reading about guys like Hugh Glass that you know been tore up by a grizzly bear <laughs> you know and uh, Jim Bridger uh, and another guy uh, left him for dead they figured he was going to die well he didn't die <clears throat> and I think the other guy's name was Fitzgerald and, and uh, Jim Bridger uh, Jim, and uh, Hugh Glass said have you ever caught Fitzgerald, he was going to tear him apart, and so, I mean, because Hugh Glass, I think he had to crawl 200 miles, Fitzgerald live off of berries, and, and roots and everything. Yeah. Finally, and he survived. He finally caught up with Fitzgerald, yeah. Gerald, yeah. and Fitzgerald quickly enlisted in the army. So <laughs> it's army property. <laughs> but Jim Bridger was was one of the guys that left him for dead. But there's lots of stories about the grizzly bears. And uh, you know what they, you know the, the tremendous difficulty. I read another book called Tough Trip Through Paradise by a guy whose name I think was Garcia. He came into Montana from New Mexico in about 1878. First located in the Muscle Shell River. You know, ended up marrying a, a Nez Pierce wife. But uh, you know, how he was out there. He had his dog, and the dog, you know, found a grizzly out there and came yapping into the tent. And the grizzly bear. <laughs> Follow the dog, so that was, you know. So I mean, man and grizzlies don't, you know, they keep they're not compatible. You're gonna, so you can see what they're doing with American Prairie, East American American Prairie Reserve, and these things. They're step by step setting it up. <coughs> they they're gonna eventually want to run all the people out of Gallatin Valley as part of the uh, Greater Yellowstone ecosystem, and uh, they're gonna want to convert that over and. Uh, so, you know, you just got these guys that, you know, trying to eventually force everybody into high-rise apartments in 15-minute cities uh, where you don't have any ability to travel or anything like that. So just, uh, you know, big picture things is what's going on. And uh, so lions, you know, they, they disappeared into reserves. You mentioned the American Prairie Reserve for I think it's just piece? American Prairie right now. Yeah. Well, it, APR. Um, That's what it was. I think they changed the name. 
in, in any event, it was, uh, we heard something on the radio on the way over. And, um, <clears throat> you know, there's been a lot of advertising, I don't know if you've caught it, but against Sheehy for his $12,000 hunts on his property. But they didn't mention that on the American Prairie Reserve, which is not really anybody's property, supposedly, they have uh, several, they collect $140,000 in private hunts with gourmet chefs and the whole works, except it was tax-free. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. See, is, is, you know, I mean, for example, there was something called the Circle C Ranch uh, in, uh, well, it was just east of the Little Rockies and ran the territory between the, the Missouri River and the Milk River. So, you know, you're talking 60 miles by 60 miles. You know, uh, big Robert Colburn, uh, he was a Scotsman who came to Canada and then he worked his way across the border to hit the gold strike in Helena. I think his yeah. number, original claim, first one was number five, and the other one was number eight, so that's pretty early. But he got claim jumped, so then he developed a couple other claims, kept his gold, <laughs> went and uh, built a ranch in the Flatwillow area around Grass Range, and then and worked with the, the, the big forward. money over at Deer Lodge, and eventually set up the Circle C, which is a very large, successful cattle operation. Oh, you know, they couldn't there. homestead that. I mean. The federal law allows you to homestead. It used to be a quarter of a section. You know, that was set up in the ordinance of 1787 uh, by the uh, Articles of Confederation. And then uh, the, you know, and that worked fine for Indiana and Ohio and Illinois, but you try to, you know, make a living on a quarter section of eastern Montana, you know, so they did expand it to a quarter, but see, or from a quarter to a whole section, square mile. But that's not even close to enough either. So, you know, the Circle C was running all that range. And then, uh, you know, according to Walt Colburn, um, you know, the older brothers had poor management, and so they had to sell it to one of the big ranches out of Texas called the Matador. And so you'll see it on the map as, as a Matador. Uh, you know, a lot of BLM because in 1908, I think it was, uh, any unhomesteaded property the federal government just took and put it under the, the leadership of the BLM. And out of that, they created the Forest Service in the, under the Department of Agriculture instead of under the Department of Interior. But uh, so, uh, so the Matador was running all that area. Well, the American Prairie Reserve bought the Matador as one of the ranches. You know, we're talking, we're talking hundreds of thousands of acres of property. You know, C.R. Morrison in uh, Livingston now, you know, he was from uh, Whitlash, and of course he, you know, knew all those guys up there, and so he had a buddy come in from east that wanted to go see the old ranches, and they'd go up there, and all of a sudden, here's the American Prairie Reserve, and uh, I think the sign said, you know, preserving the heritage of the American cowboy. And CR says, ain't a cow horse on the place, you know. <laughs> so, see, but they're buying up all that property on both sides of the Missouri River. See, it's part of that. They estimate uh, they're going to have 3 million acres, which is roughly the size of Yellowstone Park, in Valley and, uh, and Phillips counties for the running of Bath Buffalo. See, so just step by step taken all this property. And who do you think is gonna manage it best? The, you know, the, the, the farmers and ranchers that actually care? Or the federal government, see? So you're, you're seeing again a Marxist operation in line to wipe out step-by-step -step private property and to essentially force the American public, uh, what's left of them, into high-rise villages. You know, I think I mentioned when I went to uh, Russia in 1994 to, uh, you know, again, Mr. Matt Wilson was with me. We went to, uh, you know, try to work with John Dowdy and his wife, Fietta, in St. Petersburg. Appreciate Jerry and Jane Hoffman's contact with John over the years. That's how my contact with John developed. And, uh, you know, went to St. Petersburg, and, uh, you know, one of the places we went to was a collective farm. And the name of that collective farm was Kaminarov, which means commune, okay? And uh, 
I think there was 25,000 people living in high rises as the workers on the collective farm. See, that's how there's no private property, so they just build these big collective farms, build high rise. So how you you know again they got you. See, and that's what they're that's what they're working on, and uh, it's part of the onslaught against the gospel of Christ and uh, the Western civilization that developed out of the scripture and made the restoration of the of the church possible. So it's part of the overall warfare that sometimes. You know, when you have the details, sometimes you forget the bigger picture. But that's that's what's happened in Montana, and it's you know a, a part of a major program. Years ago, I had a guy named Michael Kaufman come in. He was uh, an American Opinion slash John Birch Society speaker. Michael, I think he had his undergraduate degree from University of Idaho in forestry, and his uh, PhD from. Uh, Flagstaff, uh, Northern Arizona University, and he was working at that time for Champion uh, Lumber in, in New Hampshire in uh, private property forms. But he he did, uh, you know, the the private companies spent about a half a billion dollars doing research, establishing that uh, wildlife functions a lot better in a managed forest than it does in an unmanaged forest. If you ever seen the, you know, the the aftermath of the beetle kill on the lodgepole pine and and what you know, what that looks like and how wildlife's going to function in the middle of those blowdowns you get an idea that why a managed forest might be a lot better environment for for wildlife you know they laid it on the you know the uh, desks of uh, each of the senators and house representatives uh, guess how much traction they got zero see in the process of that he discovered uh, uh, something that was at work, and he had to go to Europe to get the, the book. It was about a thousand pages. But what it was doing as a globalist, but as applied to America, it was called the Wildlands Project. And uh, he had that all documented. He had a he had a map showing where, once again, people are going to be forcibly removed from the river valleys and areas that they designate, and uh, you know, put into to. Uh, high-rise communes uh, where they can be managed. And you've seen stuff on 15-minute cities. Uh, that's, that's what the plan, but it's been in motion since 1984, I think, is the year on that, the Wildlands Project. And, you know, he had it all documented. Uh, some years ago, you know, used to do try to do it well, Tuesday night a month at the uh, old courthouse until they finally said that uh, we had too many kids creating too much problems. Like, Right, Gary probably remembers. Yeah, we had a lot of kids created a lot of problems, uh, but uh, yeah, so we couldn't use the court, old courthouse anymore. But uh, one time I was doing one on Yellowstone to Yukon, and the uh, so you know there was a left wing guy that showed up, and he was trying to get us to you know all get our guns and go to Washington D.C. You know, just a very clumsy attempt at being an agent provocateur. Okay. But when that finished up, uh, there was a guy sitting in the back, and as he came by, he dropped me a note, and he said, call me. So he was the head of the uh, Greater Yellowstone Coalition. Okay, and I don't know, you know, uh, I, I never took the time to call him. You know, you only got so much you can do, so many. But he did arrange for me to have an interview with uh, uh, PBS on Yellowstone to Yukon. And so I'm interviewing the lady, and, or she's interviewing me, actually, well, really. <laughs> but uh, anyhow, I had with me one of Michael Kaufman's maps of the Wildlands Project and what the intent of it was. See, and so I'm going through and I'm answering her questions. She's getting really shook up. And she told me, she said, you know, I'll, I'll, when we get this done and get ready to play it, she said, I'll send you a copy of it. But uh, she got really shook up. I mean, and she said, well, what would your closing statement be? You know, because I'm making the point that Yellowstone to Yukon's purpose is to eventually put the, you know, public in slavery. She said, so do you have a closing statement? I said, yeah, it's actually not Yellowstone to Yukon. It's from sea to shining sea. And uh, they never played the interview, by the way, <laughs> because it's too pointed. It's too graphic. 
You know, you see billboards up here. We need a, we need a wildlife crossing, right? You've seen the billboard. See, that's all part of the Wildlands Project. See, is to create these wildlife corridors. Um, the Dorothy M. Hunt Foundation, I think, has put up nearly $100 million to step-by-step -step purchase all the property between Gallant and Gateway, private property between Gallant and Gateway and uh, West Yellowstone. See, in order to make that all part of the corridor. See, the uh, American Prairie Reserve, that's all part of it. See, they, they're all coordinated here uh, as, a, as a big program. And the goal, see, is to eventually wipe out our freedom to preach the gospel of Christ, if you just think that's politics, okay? Because it's not, it's, it's warfare, it's what it is, and we have to understand and process that, so. Any further questions or thoughts or comments on any of that? Say Josh and then Bob. You know, from a human perspective, it's pretty discouraging because, you know, how do you stop that juggernaut, see? But that's, you know, that's where the gospel of Christ and us being new creations and recognizing that uh, our citizenship is in heaven. My question was something else. So if there's oh, okay. okay. To add on that. All right, Bob? <clears throat> well, I got comments about grizzly bears. Um, probably 20 years ago, a guy named Musser had an auction group. They're still functioning in Billings, and he had an estate sale. And he had a bear trap with uh, part of the bear's leg in it. And the story was that a guy had set traps went out to check the traps and never came back and so they figured that the grizzly chewed his own leg off and then overtook the guy and whatever happened we'll never know uh -huh. but that was an interesting piece of history i couldn't get to the auction and i didn't buy it which is just as well as, as far as homesteading i want to mention my mom's dad came from england in the 90s and he homesteaded in the, the highway mountains right yeah and uh he got a section up there in the, uh, the mountains. And then Grandpa, Dad's dad, came from Michigan in 16. He could have homesteaded, but he'd have been like 25 miles out of town. So he bought a half section from a woman named Grandma Huntley that had homesteaded and proved up on it. So I want to do some research. I think that the only land she had was this half section, but I'll do some research on that. Yeah. See, because again, the federal government started taking all of it. Can, do you think you can homestead a BLM section today? Not a chance. See. So, good. All right, Josh. Um, so this one's a, a little complicated. The um, I've been digging into some information that would perhaps be considered Gnosticism, <laughs> and. Um, I've come across different sort of like laws of the universe, I'll say. And that's what it's referred to, I suppose. And with modern culture being so fixated on promoting the woke agenda, which is like making sacred the marginalized like gender identities, which they claim as a spectrum, something that is going through my mind, one of these like laws is... Um, gender, like a uh, law of gender, how um, masculine and feminine energy is in everything and everyone. And I thought about that on a deeper level and with God being everything, undeniably, like, and he is one entity, for, for lack of a better term there, W rather than a duality, wouldn't it be just one? How could you explain to someone? Because um, in Genesis, I know it says God made them male and female. How can you s communicate to someone it's male, line drawn, female, not male and female? You know what I mean? Yeah. Okay. Well, it does say male and female, so you know, we have to go with the wording on that. But, uh, you know, the... For the, in the physical realm, okay, you have to have male and female. I mean, you do, otherwise you don't have any procreation. So, and uh, so, you know, plants, you know, pistols and stamens, you know, the entire animal world, you know, you got male, female, you have to have that in the physical realm. You don't have anything. And uh, so, but God had a, 
a, you know, a bigger reason for doing that. Let's go back to Genesis 2. See, which really is going to be the ultimate answer to your question. In Genesis 2, the... Um, Verse uh, 18, and God, then the Lord God said, side comment here, and you see where the word uh, Lord, with a letter all caps, that's Yahweh, okay? In Genesis 1, it's just God, that's Elohim. So your, your critics will try to say that there's two different creation accounts, Genesis chapter 1 being the E account, and Genesis chapter 2 being the J account, and they're clearly written by different authors. You know, I mean, that's, uh, you know, the garbage that's out there, you know. But uh, just have to be aware of it. So the Lord God said, it's not good for the man to be alone. I'll make him a helper suitable for him. And out of the ground, the Lord formed every beast of the field and every bird of the sky and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called the living creature, that was its name. Notice that language was instantly created by God. See? So man has the capacity to speak in grammatical language, and he has enough of a vocabulary to give names to all the animals. All right? All right? So, and, uh, so the man gave names to all the cattle, to the birds of the sky, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there is not found a helper suitable for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on the man, and he slept. Then he took one of his ribs, God took one of his ribs, and closed up the flesh at that place. The Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man, and brought her to the man. And the man said, this is now bone of my bone, and flesh of my flesh. See, it's interesting here. He didn't say spirit of my spirit. See, bones of, bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And for this reason, the man shall leave his father and his mother and shall be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked, were not ashamed. And of course, you know, it is amazing how when marriage works, that it does work. Uh, pretty clearly, the female body is different than the male body. I was, uh, you know, uh, Don Patton on his website, uh, the uh, Bible.ca, um, he has a section on dinosaurs and different things, and there's one where he has uh, documented that I think it was in 1964 or thereabouts in Utah, this uh, guy was running a dozer, blading off a side of the hill to make a road, and all of a sudden he hit some human skeletons, so he just stopped. So they went back and investigated. I think there's 16 human skeletons fossilized in the Dakota sandstone, okay? Dakota sandstone is one where you find dinosaurs. And uh, so, you know, and they're fossilized. Uh, a lot of times the teeth were, uh, were turquoise. The jaw and uh, the bones were, you know, kind of an iron compound called malachite. That's why he has it under the heading called malachite, man. But, uh, you know, pretty clearly, I mean, he goes through and says, okay, here's how we know these weren't skeletons that were buried later. You know, he goes through all the documentation, showed that they were actually fossilized when the Dakota sandstone was forming. Okay, so I was showing those pictures to a, a nursing student, and she says, oh, these are female bones, and these are male bones. Uh-huh. Okay, why? Because female bones are different than male bones, right? You know, I mean, you know, us guys just don't have the right pelvis for childbirth, you know, just, just, just won't work, right? I mean, that's... Uh, you know, there's the difference. See, so bone, my bone, flesh of my flesh, God made female, you know, to, you know, be the counterpart to male. And uh, so he made them in the physical realm, male and female. Okay. But what about in the spirit realm? See, what's a, what's a woman's spirit? How different is it from a man's spirit? Well, it's not. See, the spirit is in the image of God, whether a person physically is male or female. 
And that's why God has the same plan of redemption for males as he does for me, females. See, it's exactly the same set of reasoning, same presentation, the same set of logic, right? Of course, in Ephesians chapter 5, Starting in verse 28, Ephesians 5, 28, says, uh, So husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife, own wife loves himself. No one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church, because we're members of his body. And for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall, be, shall cleave to his wife. Yeah. I don't know why you got to get rid of some of those old words. They're, they're really good words. Uh, cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Paul says, this mystery is great, but I'm speaking with reference to Christ and the church. So you notice that the physical marriage here, uh, union of male, male and female, was designed to ultimately show the union of Christ and his church. So he sets it up male and female so that we can process then how that union, spiritual union, is going to take place. See, there's always a bigger picture that God has in mind. And, of course, if you don't, you know, if you don't, if you're like a new ager, or, you know, woke or any of these other guys, you're looking, you're looking at a very small spectrum, not really realizing, you know, what God did. So in Galatians chapter 3, and uh, verse 26 Okay, and uh, I realize this is be offensive language to the woke agenda, but it says, you are all sons of God. Okay, are you okay with that, Julie? Uh, you're all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who are immersed into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free man, neither male nor female. You're all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you're Abraham's descendant heirs according to promise. See, so God is way out in front on that. And uh, so the, the male-female thing is ultimately designed as a communication tool for God's purpose, where we end up all being one in God and yet never lose our identity. So further thoughts on that, Josh? Okay. Anybody else want to comment on it? I have a question along those lines. Um, you know, the so, the difference between male and female, physical. Obviously, there's different roles in the church mm -hmm. for male and female, and some of it is be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Whatever, whether it be angels, males, females, God expects us to to stay in the lane, if you will, that He has given to us. But we also can say there's some there's some logical reasons. It's not arbitrary why God has different, different roles for male and female. Would you categorize that then not in the soul level, but still the physical differences, like the, the, maybe some of the wiring we might say? It, yeah. You would put that in the, in the physical side, not the soul level in terms of differences? Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean some of the studies they've been able to do is when you have a, you know, when you have the, the fetus at a very young age, if it's male, you know, then, you know, the, it starts destroying some of the early connections. You know, the, you know, the brain has two halves and there's a pretty thick, you know, set of nerves between the two halves called the corpus callosum or colossum. And, uh, and so a bunch of those nerves are destroyed in the male, see, where they're not destroyed in the female, see. What that does is enables the female to function with a much more broader awareness of what's going on. It's called raising kids, okay? Whereas the male, you know, is able to single track, to, to, to focus. See, and that's why a guy can go out there and sit in a hunting blind, you know, for hours and, you know, track down the, the wily beast or whatever, see, and that's very difficult for a female to do. Uh, but see, that's, you know, I mean, God made us male and female, and that's part of the physical, physical side of man, which does have to do with how the brain functions or operates. I mean, there's obviously difference. Uh, 
you know, you know, males have to learn how females communicate, and uh, to the extent that they do, and females and males have to learn how females communicate, and uh, try to learn how to listen, you know, and find out what was really said, actually, than than the actual words sometimes are said, you know, uh, sometimes. No means yes, and yes means no, and you have to be smart enough to figure out what that is. Uh, you know, it's called living with your wife in an understanding way. Uh, so, you know, there's there's a learning process involved, and under the right, uh, you know, conditions that can be fun. Uh, under the wrong conditions, it can be not fun. Okay, but so it's always diff physical, even how our brains process a little bit, but. At the core, see, there's still, you know, if you turn to Isaiah chapter 1, it doesn't matter whether you're male or female. Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 18, you know, you know, a very basic scripture there, but God said, come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. And he says that to both male and female, doesn't he? Uh, though your sins are scarlet, they'll be white as snow. Though they're red like crimson, be like wool. So, the at the core, both the male and the female have to be able to reason correctly. And you know, the devil will use maybe different things on females to get them off track uh, than he does males. But uh, you know, it, it's still the same core processor that's operating there. Uh, that's got to process truth. And that's why God's got one plan of salvation uh, for all of mankind. And uh, so in, the, in Matthew 22, remember this is a situation where the Sadducees wanted to trap Jesus because they didn't believe in the resurrection. Of course, <laughs> Jesus obviously believes in the resurrection because he's going to have one, <laughs> okay? Okay. Uh, so they're trying to trap him, and they set up the deal where the woman had uh, seven husbands, you know, lawfully. And uh, so, you know, then the husbands all died. And so, so in verse 27, uh, Matthew 22, 27, last of all, the woman died. In the resurrection, therefore, whose wife will the seven be? For they all had her. So, you know, my old version just said they all had her. <laughs> I don't you know. They stuck married in there in italics to help soften the blow, I think. Uh, but Jesus answered and said to them, You're mistaken, not understanding the Scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. See, there's no male or female in eternity. See, we're just all spirit beings and uh, all of equal value, all equal standing. We're all going to get a white stone with a name on it. A new name written, which nobody knows except us on an individual basis. See, and that's where God's going with that. So, any f further comments? Anybody else? Yeah, Marshall. So then, in Second Corinthians six eighteen, um, we're talking about you should be sons and daughters to me. Yeah. Is what are what's the purpose of that? Um, language then yeah. that's all in caps right right old testament quote old testament quote right but where are we going with that then? yeah see it, it, we're going toward the temple of god you know and the true tabernacle of god where god dwells in us and walks among us you know he told them back there in the old testament he said if you do these things i'll walk among you and be sons and daughters to me because using physical terminology for physical people see but once we move to the new covenant it's going to take on a spiritual meaning ultimately in the ultimate tabernacle of God, neither male nor female. Right now, you know, the, he, you know we can be sons and daughters, and he'll live in us and, and walk among us and dwell with us. But the ultimate is, you know, that's gone too. So for the thoughts? Okay. Any other questions or comments on that? Another question today? Yeah, Josh. Um, so how do you, it, when working with people, um, 
how do you uh, navigate between the objective and the subjective when um, obviously there's a lot of emotions involved, but um, uh, is the goal simply to focus purely on the objective and sort of disregard the subjective? Or is there some sort of way to navigate those lines in which the subjective could be um, incorporated into the objective? How, like, how do you, um, I don't know, not necessarily validate, but not invalidate the subjective in that? You understand what yeah, I'm doing? Yeah, very much. Yeah, because you're working with people. You obviously have to deal with the subjective and the emotions and all that sort of thing. You know, you, you know experience you know, will help you on that. But, you know, so sometimes you're you know, trying to help people's emotions, you know, process positively. They can help you. Um, many times emotions are the enemy of truth, which is... Uh, actually the biggest problem that you have. And so, so many times you have to have people say, you know, set your emotions off to the side for a little bit so we can take an objective look at this. Because when emotions are running things, it's, uh, you know, you run across that so many times. You hit Acts 238, you know, people got an emotional response. And, uh, okay, so, you know, once the emotions take over, the rational, rational processes go off into the stratosphere. And, uh, you know, you, you, can't, uh, you can't make any progress. You know, just retell a story. Uh, when Mr. and Mrs. Hoffman were in Butte, you know, we were doing what was called the 13 weeks. I had overhead projection and coming in doing proof that the Bible's the Word of God. You remember doing that at your house, actually. And uh, there was a Kraft Cheese representative that Jerry had contact with, and uh, he was out of town. I think we were doing it on Monday nights, and so he was in Helena on those nights, but his wife came. And uh, so at some point she said, hey, could, uh, you know, we set up a, something where my husband can be there. He can't be there on, on Monday nights because he's, he's in Helena. And so uh, Mrs. Lawn and Wilson and I, we used to have assembly on Tuesday nights, so I set up a Wednesday evening appointment and uh, drove over to Butte, sat down, asked him, me to tell, asked him to tell me the story of his conversion. You know, say, how is he, how you, you know, you, did you say you were saved? You know, uh, how did that happen? Well, he was on a trip into Colorado and he was in the middle of a camp, camp, bunch of campus crusade guys and so at some point he invited Christ into his heart and was saved. And so, say I like to always get that nailed down first because sometimes you have to go back to it. And uh, so, he, you know, and that's, that's good advice for you guys. Always get the person's story first, really early on. Because, you know, people's emotions tend to, to move things a little bit. So, so then I went through the rabbit shooters. See, and let's look at Acts 2.38. I knew I was going to get that in here somehow. So, just in case anybody doesn't know what that says, it says, repent, and each of you be immersed in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Hey, Marshall, the, uh, if you look at the Amplified Bible now, they've gone back to, they, they left off that because of, and they went back to for, for free. Well, no, take a look at the newest one. I mean, they even, they even changed it. It's like... Okay, some pressure from somewhere. Anyhow, for the forgiveness of your sins, you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Uh, okay, so he's looking at that verse. Of course, he understands that saved and forgiveness are the same thing. You know, that's what you're saved from is your sins. He, he got that nailed down. And I asked him the question, uh, you know, because he was saved first and then going to be baptized later. I said, so let me ask you a question. I said, can a person be forgiven before they're forgiven? Okay. Now, he's looking at that for a long time. Finally, he looks up and he says, yes. Okay. What happened? The emotions ran it, right? And uh, so I said, well, 
we just hit the points where words don't have meaning. And uh, so I just folded up my Bible, which is the signal, you know, that we're done here. And, uh, you know, thanked them for letting me come over, had a closing word of prayer, and made her a nice exit, and she never showed up again. You know, uh, but see, that's a good example. Uh, you know, it isn't just females that are emotions. Guys got their emotions, too. Sometimes they express them differently. But, you know, there was a good case where the emotion was the enemy of reason. And try to get him to set his emotion aside, couldn't do it. And unfortunately, that's the vast bulk of where your prospects are going to land. Their emotions are going to override reason. And what we are in the process of doing is looking for people who are serious enough, truth seekers, that they'll set those emotions aside and let the core processor, male or female, work to see what the truth is. And uh, so that's, you're just going to have to work through a bunch of people. There's no, there's no getting around it. You know, the sower sows seed, and, you know, the bulk of the seed falls on the hound, you know, hard ground. And even the seed that uh, does bear, look like it may be going to bear fruit, a lot of it gets, uh, you know, is gone quickly, and others of it gets choked out. And, you know, there's uh, only a comparatively few that uh, are the real good soil. And that's, Jesus told that parable to let us know what the landscape actually is so that we don't get discouraged in the process. If we can keep in mind that what we're trying to find is truth seekers and that there's a winnowing process going on, that the Word of God is in the process of separating those who will from those who won't. And, uh, you know, you don't have to be, um, you don't have to do it perfectly. See, because if, a truth, if you've got a truth seeker, you know, you can make some mistakes or say, you know what, I don't know the answer to that question. You, you know, a truth seeker will stay with that. See, an excuse maker will find anything they can to jump off track. So uh, you don't have to do it perfectly. It's nice to have a track to run on so that you have, know where you're going, so you can lay the right foundation and all the things go with it. But you don't have to do it perfectly. It's just important to do it. And you'll learn along the way. You'll, you'll get better. But you could do it perfectly. And guess what? You know, it just... See, sometimes some of the brethren think, look, if we explain everything right, make sure they understand this before they're immersed, that will guarantee the proper result. It doesn't work that way. You know, two seekers will follow through even if everything isn't taught perfectly or completely. Uh, you, and you can't really, if you try to teach everything about Im everybody about immersion, somebody, everything about immersion before they get immersed, that that's going to take a long time because you start studying immersion and all the things that it impacts and what sets the stage for you're way too much you know you don't you don't have to they don't have to know everything about immersion you just have to know for forgiveness of sins receive the gift of the holy spirit you know buried with christ in immersion resurrected to walk a newness of life that's that's the core things that they need to know and uh, you can't guarantee that anybody heard what you said anyway. Yeah, that's my experience. You could say it perfectly. Did anybody hear? That's, that's another question. And uh, so uh, my advice always is have fun. You know, go out there and run some experiments, have some fun. And, and uh, you know, sometimes you'll say, you know what? I'm just going to learn a really good lesson here because... Uh, you know, I just ran up against somebody who kind of turned me inside out. Well, that's, that's good. That's great experience. You know, I mean, you know, you, you learn from those things. And the uh, fact is sometimes the, it's learning by experience is, is, is the best teacher. So, yeah. So you're going to have to, yeah, you're going to have to deal with emotions. It's going to depend on a lot on the individual you're dealing with. And, uh, and, and then you'll gain a little experience on how to do it better. But don't worry about it. Have fun. It'll come.